Testing one, two, testing. All right, it is. Uh... All right, I like to call the uh, Health and Human Services Committee of the Mecklenburg County Board of County Commissioners to order. Uh, this is our January 17th, 2024, our first meeting of the year. So I hope everybody had a wonderful uh, holiday and uh, ready to work. So I want to start off by uh, calling the meeting to order and introducing our staff, but also to say thank you and welcome to our guests that are in-house, as well as those who are viewing our meeting online. Uh, with that said, I'd like for our commissioners to introduce themselves. I go from right to left, and we'll start with committee members first, and then we have a guest commissioner with us also. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Meyer, and I represent District 5. Good afternoon. I'm Mecklenburg County Commissioner Elaine Powell, representing District 1, which is all of North Mecklenburg. And I am Arthur Griffin. I chair this committee, and I'm a county commissioner at large. We have with us one of our colleagues who's visiting with us. Please introduce yourself, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Rodriguez McDowell, uh, elected by the people of District 6. We are at a point uh, in our service where we wanted to look at income maintenance, and we've gone through most of income maintenance, and now uh, we have two other areas of WIC and TANF. Uh, for some of folk who've been around for a while, uh, it's had several names. Start off with ADC and then AFDC, uh, TANF, and now Workforce, right? First. Oh, Workforce. Uh, workforce. Sorry about that. All right. But uh, and after this, we'll weave in next year some of the services and perhaps maybe false services, et cetera. Okay. All right, with that said, let me go to our deputy uh, county manager for introduction and, oh, I forgot. We introduce him. We in introductions. Oh, staff. We staff, 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 right. Yeah. Okay. Staff, right. Sorry. Hey, keep me straight, man. All right, All right. Uh, Mr. Trotman. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Anthony Trotman, deputy county manager. Good afternoon, Stacey Lowry, director of community support services. Good afternoon, Kim Henderson, Director of Child, Family, and Adult Services. Good afternoon, Renard Washington, Public Health Director. Good afternoon, Taya Cruz, Assistant to Deputy Manager Trotman. Good afternoon, Robert Nesbitt, Chief of Staff for Health and Human Services. Good afternoon, Yolanda Griffin, Director for Department of Community Resources. Others, pass the mic back, please. Good afternoon, Jennifer Peel Gray, Manager with Economic Services Division under the Department of Community Resources. Good afternoon, 
I'm Dr. Lucille Jo Harris with Mecklenburg County Department of Community Resources. Good afternoon, Sandra Durham, Assistant Division Director in the Economic Services Division. Good afternoon, Scott Fritz, Social Services Program Manager with Economic Services Division. And good afternoon, Bernard Meeks, Director for the WIC Program. Good afternoon, Adonica Hampton, Economic Services Division Director. Good afternoon, Devon Kilpatrick, Economic Service Division Program Manager, Energy. Good afternoon, Tamika Green, Assistant Health Director for Mecklenburg County Public Health. Hi, Abby Wyatt, Livable Met Coordinator with County Manager's Office. Well, thank you and welcome to uh, today's meeting. Uh, now I'd like to ask uh, for a motion for approval of the minutes that you received in your packet. Is there such a motion? So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed the same sign. Hearing none, uh, minutes have been approved. I'll turn to our deputy counter manager to introduce uh, these two topics. Uh, first is the WIC program, which is Women, Infants, and Children's Program. Uh, Mr. Trotman, please. Yes, sir, Commissioner. We have our WIC um, director here, um, Mr. Bernard Meeks, and he's going to give you an, an overview of our WIC activities over the last um, year plus. Um, Bernard, you're up. Right. Well, once again, my name is Bernard Meeks, and I'm the director for the WIC program. Happy New Year to those that haven't said Happy New Year to. I'm here to talk about, obviously, the WIC program, it's an abbreviation for Women, Infants, and Children. Before I tell you about the WIC program, I'd like to share a little information about me, your presenter. I was born in Fort Jackson and grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, but I'm not a Carolina Gamecock fan, for those that may be. I happen to like the Clemson Tigers. In 1992, I was commissioned as an officer into the United States Army Reserves, earned my Bachelor of Science degree in Food and Nutrition from Hampton University. And Hampton University is where I also met one of the most talented and smartest women I know, my wife, Janine. We have a son named Jalen, who happens to be the world's greatest stage actor. But to be fair, I don't know very many actors. So I guess I'm a little biased. In 1994, I started working for the WIC program in Richmond, Virginia as a nutritionist assistant, next as a nutritionist. And then I worked my way up to becoming a supervisor. After about seven years of working WIC in Richmond, Virginia, I worked at Hampton University as an assistant professor of military science teaching ROTC. After a year long tour in Iraq, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina in 2005, and I've been here working in WIC since then. WIC turns 50 this year, so I think it's only appropriate to talk about how and why the program started. During the mid to late 60s, hunger and poverty in America was brought to light by an NAACP leader named Marion Wright. This also was brought to light by many public health doctors who noticed iron deficiency anemia in alarming numbers of infants and children that served in public health departments. In 1969, the public health doctor, a public health doctor named David Page in Baltimore, got a small grant to conduct a study to show how iron fortified infant formula would improve not just the iron level, but the overall health of infants. The iron fortified infant formula program was the model used for WIC today. 1972. WIC was piloted as a supplemental food program aimed at improving the health of pregnant mothers, infants, and children. In 1974, 
The first WIC site opened in Kentucky in January. WIC was operating in 45 states by the end of the year, including right here in North Carolina. 1975, WIC was established as a permanent program by legislature. Eligibility was extended to non-breastfeeding women up to six months postpartum and children up to age five. 1976 became a permanent program in the state of North Carolina. Mecklenburg County was piloted as a handful of counties, one of, as one of the handful of counties that was piloted in 1974, and once again became a full-fledged program in 1976. In 1978, legislation introduced new elements into the program, including nutrition education, nutrition requirements for food, and referrals for social services. The nutrition education piece is one of the, the parts that separates WIC from other food supplement programs like SNAP and the school lunch program. 1992, WIC introduced an enhanced food package for mothers who exclusively breastfeed, breastfed or breastfeed to further promote breastfeeding. In 1997, the United States Department of Agriculture launched the Loving Support Makes Breastfeeding Work campaign to increase adoption of breastfeeding among recipients of WIC and public support of breastfeeding. 2004, the Breastfeeding Peer Counselor Initiative was launched in which women with breastfeeding experience and training counsel other women learning to breastfeed. 2009, the USDA introduced a new food package consistent with dietary guidelines for Americans and established dietary recommendations for infants and children over two years of age. Today, WIC is available in each state, including the District of Columbia, 33 Indian tribal organizations, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, American Samoa and Guam. Today, current federal budget negotiations are considering considerable cuts to the WIC program, which could definitely impact us here in Mecklenburg County. Last week, I had the opportunity to sit in on a Zoom meeting with Congresswoman from Connecticut, who was urging all constituents to go out and and let their elected officials know how important this program is and, and to definitely not cut funds from the program. Who is eligible for WIC? An individual must reside in North Carolina and length of residency within North Carolina is not a factor, nor is US citizenship status. The individual must fulfill one of five requirements to be eligible to participate in the North Carolina WIC program. Those five requirements are as follows. Be a pregnant woman and proof of pregnancy is not required. Be a breastfeeding woman up to one year postpartum. Be a postpartum woman up to six months postpartum and regardless of the length of pregnancy or its outcome. Be an infant birth to under one year of age, be a child one year up to their fifth birthday. Family income must be less than 185% of the U.S. poverty income guidelines. For example, a family of four in a household can have an annual income of $55,500 or biweekly income of $2,135. And that would make the income eligibility. Those families that receive Medicaid, Work First, AKA TANF, or SNAP, meet the income eligibility requirement automatically. And the final eligibility requirement that an individual must be at nutritional risk as determined by a nutritionist or other health professionals. 
For example, if a participant has diabetes, high blood pressure, anemia, overweight, underweight, gaining weight too rapidly during the pregnancy, or just a plain old inappropriate diet, makes them eligible for the program. What WIC provides. So here's a list of some of the foods that are provided from the WIC program. Milk, milk substitutes, including cow's milk, evaporated milk, UHT milk, soy-based beverage, lactose-free or lactose-reduced milk, cheese, yogurt, and tofu. Whole milk is the standard milk for issuance to children 12 to 23 months of age. Reduced fat milk is the standard milk offered to children aged 24 months and older. All approved WIC cereals are fortified with iron. Fruits and vegetables can be purchased fresh, fresh, frozen, or canned. And organic items are also approved to purchase at the store. We are very fortunate to have a breastfeeding peer counselor program here in Mecklenburg County, because not all counties have a breastfeeding peer counselor program. We have two full-time and five part-time lactation counselors, and they offer education and support to our pregnant and breastfeeding participants. Locations, WIC offices are located at the health department buildings on Beatty's Ford Road and Billingsley Road, and both CRCs on Freedom Drive and Stitt Road. We moved into the LB Scarborough CRC on August 23rd, started serving participants two days later on August 25th, 2023. The LB Scarborough, um, Scarborough serves almost half of the WIC participants on the WIC program here in Mecklenburg County. When WIC is fully staffed, we have 73 employees and 67 being full-time, six being part-time. We currently have seven temp staff and six vacancies. Those vacancies being one nutritionist, two nutrition assistants, one WIC supervisor, one senior WIC interviewer, and one part-time lactation counselor. Five of these positions are currently posted or in the posting stage, and one offer has been extended. We have 14 bilingual Spanish-English speaking staff and one French-English speaking staff. With caseload from state physical year 18 through state physical year 23, as you notice on the slide, 2018 numbers were a little over 20,000 and they were falling off, of course, and by 2019. And if you recall during this time period, 2016, up until this time period, 2019, the economy was doing very well. If you um, Drove around in the uptown area, you probably saw at least 10 cranes, which of course represents growth and development in the city. Of course, when 2020 hit, our numbers started to go back up, as you see here, over 18,000. Did a real big jump from 2020 to 2021, over 4,000 participants. And from 21 to 22, almost 1,000 more participants. And from 22 to 23, Roughly about 2,000 more participants joined the WIC program. A couple of months during that year, we hit over 27,000 participants. Participation by race and ethnicity. On the first pie chart, 49.5% 
represents those individuals on our program that rep that um identify as white or Caucasian, represents almost 50% of the pie chart and over 11,000 participants. 44.6% represents those individuals that identify as Black or African American, over 10,000 particip um, participants. And those that identify as Asian represents 2.71% of the pie with 751 participants. Those that identify as multi-race represents 2.7% of the pie chart with 693 participants. Those that identify as American Indian or Alaskan Native represents 0.34% of the pie chart with 78 participants. And those that identify as Native Hawaiian represents 0.09% of the pie chart with 27 participants. This data is from um, the stats of November, 2023. On the ethnicity side, for Hispanic or Latino, those that identify as Hispanic or Latino represent 41% of the pie chart. And those that identify as non-Hispanic or non-Latino represent 59% of the pie chart. A year before November 2022, those that identified as Hispanic or Latino was at 37%. So it made a 4% increase from 2022 to 2023. And just to let you know that that number has been pretty consistent for the last decade. When we opened up the site at Clanton Road, we did a GIS mapping, and it was roughly about 40% at that time, and that was back in around 2009-2010 time frame. The blue bar on this slide represents WIC participants that have given birth and those numbers range from 5,500 on up to 6,200. And the orange color bar represents women that have initiated breastfeeding. And as you can see from 2017 to 2021, approximately 70 to 72% of our women participants initiated breastfeeding. No data been provided beyond the 2021 time period, but it should be coming out sometime in the near future. And I'm very interested to see because this is the time period around 2021, 2022, between that time period is when we started having uh, recalls on formula. So I think that's when you start to see these numbers increase and you'll see that on this next slide here. The blue bar represents infant participants that have been breastfeeding up to six weeks. And the orange color bar represents our infant participants that continue to be breastfed at six months of age. The great thing about this slide is that the orange bar starts to gradually increase in 2020. And our numbers have never been this high before since I've been working with the WIC program. And this trend is, is is the same trend across the whole state for 2023. The last WIC director's uh, call I sat in on, they said the numbers for the state are at 38%, which is of course a record high. This is a record high for us here in Mecklenburg County. Um, and as you see, the numbers have just been continuing to go up from 2018 from 27.1% on up to 34 0.9% in 2022. I'm willing to bet that it's probably very close to 40% once we get the data that comes out for the 2023 results. This graph shows the massive amount of money 
that was spent at our local vendors in FY23, over $20 million. We see this increase each month due to the programs continue, continue to grow during the FY23 year. And I believe the fruits and vegetables benefits being increased during COVID played a significant role as well. $20 million. Impact of public health emergency. Federal waivers allowing virtual appointments and automatic issuance of WIC benefits by the state office ended on August 1st, 2023. That resulted in roughly a 20% reduction in our caseload over the first six days due to WIC participants not being compliant with program requirements. That program requirement, nutrition education required piece that separates us from the other food supplement programs. We have since rebounded due to the extending program hours create creating more opportunities to provide nutrition education and appointments to issue benefits. We've also hired additional nutritionists and admin temporary staff to include bilingual staff to work in our call center. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services provided additional ARPA support to allow us to continue doing virtual appointments for our participants not able to meet in person for office visits. And for those not aware, OPER is abbreviation for American Rescue Plan Act that the president signed a $1.9 trillion and this OPER support will, will be in place until September 30th, 2026. This slide speaks to our participants that can now use the self-checkout lane and our largest vendor, Walmart. And hopefully our other vendors will soon get on board to make the transition of purchasing food items at the store a little bit easier. For those that are familiar with the WIC program when it started, we got the paper voucher and we graduated to the debit card around 2013, and now we're able to do self-checkouts. Well, hopefully, we'd, like I said, we'll get some other vendors on board sometime in the near future to make that transition a little bit easier for our participants. Questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Weeks. Um, I'm sure there may be a question or two from my colleagues. Oh, sorry. Somebody else's presentation look like here. That's the next. Is that this presentation? It's the next presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, let me uh, call on my colleagues to see if there are any questions uh, of Mr. Weeks. Um, Lauren, then I'll, I'll, I'll get the committee folks first. Uh, Susan, then coming in. Lauren. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm a Clemson fan too, so we can um, commiserate on that. Um, so my, I'm going to start with the very end. Are you so no other grocery store chain has self checkout for WIC participants? No, ma'am, <laughs> not yet. I'm hoping some other ones get on board, but right now Walmart is the only one. Why is that? Is it cost? Um, it's probably a money issue for the, for the vendors. Um, I, I honestly, I don't know why they haven't gotten on board. It seemed like it's been two years right now since Walmart has offered that service. And I was thinking, I was hoping that the Food Lion, um, Paris Teeter, Publix, those types of stores would jump on board. But as of yet, that hasn't happened. Well, at Food Lion, they've got all kinds of little signs everywhere on the shelves that, you know, show you what's WIC. And so it, I'm surprised. So the agreements are negotiated by the state WIC office. And so we don't have a lot of immediate control here locally to be able to do any of that. But um, it is really 
depends on the state when they either engage those vendors to get them to basically adopt the technology that's needed at the self-checkout to confirm that the products that are being purchased are able to be, you're able to use your WIC card to purchase those. So um, it is a state WIC decision when and how that happens. Interesting. So WIC is a federal program and then um, goes to the state and then and, and then to us. So, um, and we keep hearing about the cuts that are about to happen. Um, have you looked at that and how that's going to affect our own participants here in Mecklenburg County and how many? Yes, ma'am. I'm expecting our caseload not to, to drop significantly. I'm, I'm hoping that, I'm hopeful that it's around 23,000 since that's been pretty much our average. It's averaging out for this past year. And that's what they typically do. They base it off the previous year. And so I'm hopeful that that's what it'll be. Uh, and then that won't be a significant cut to our program. But we honestly and truly won't know until they decide on a budget um, for the federal government. So, so it's based on need. Well, it's, a, it's all based on sort of what they determine. So the way WIC works is that the federal government allocates a certain amount of money to the WIC program. And then that bucket of money is disaggregated, is distributed across states based on the prior year's caseload. So how many cases you had on the WIC program prior they try to estimate how many, how much need you may have in an assign the virus in the state. What's happening right now is that the USDA is fighting to be able to not, I think they're talking about potentially cutting the WIC program by as much as half uh, of its federal budget. If they do that, then that would mean that we would only have enough resource available for half of the folks that we are able to support today. And so there's a lot of uncertainty right now because it's anywhere between half and keeping it funded where it is today. And we just don't know. And so we've, we've, sent letters to our delegation. Uh, we have, uh, as Bernard said, we participated in at least the state calls that are having with WIC directors, but it is a potential for a really big challenge. This is um, one of the few programs that doesn't, that's a health kind of program, but it's in the USDA's budget. So it's, it's important right now because it's being negotiated as a part of the agricultural budget. And so we don't actually know. And the cut will first come to the state. So whether or not we have any immediate impact is still TBD versus it'll have an impact next year when it comes down to funding the program for next next state federal fiscal year. So it's still a lot of to be determined, but if they actually cut it, we're it could have a huge impact on the ability for us to can keep the program. Do we um turn anyone away now, even if they're eligible, because we don't have the resources? Not no, now. No, okay. And so if this does happen and they cut half and we don't get as much as we normally do, we'll have to actually turn people away. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty about what it means for the WIC programs across the country. I and mean, we just don't know. I mean, if the cuts will be applied universally, if it'll be applied, we don't we don't actually know what to expect. Okay. So um, the WIC advocacy arms are in full throttle right now, uh, both the State WIC Association, National WIC, uh, because it is the potential for a really large cut. Okay. Yeah, what they're talking about right now is cutting the, the benefits for fruits and vegetables, it took a, a, a big jump uh, since it was uh, since it started in 2009. A child would get six dollars to buy fruits and vegetables, which, of course, is not a lot. And now that's up to twenty six dollars for a child. And so that's what they're talking about. The cuts being in that area, but it could be more than that. Like so Dr. This, said, this we will... just don't know exactly. This will be a topic at NACO as well by our committee, as well as the large urban county caucus. And Starl is also working on this with our lobbyists. Thank you. Thank you. When you go, I won't be able to go, but make sure you find out, are they reducing the um, USDA's um, stipends? <laughs> Farmers <laughs> <laughs> to agribusiness? <laughs> anyway, I'll just make a comment. Uh, Commissioner Powell. Thank you. Uh, thanks for giving some personal background. I always love that. But you didn't say why you chose nutrition. I like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering. <laughs> now, it was one of my favorite subjects when I was in, uh, in high school, home economics. Uh, and so that's why I choose, chose to be a nutritionist. It's important. It is. Uh, on slide 10, on the breakdown of race and ethnicity, it's a little confusing to me. I was trying to, you said 37% is Hispanic Latino? 
In yep. 2022, that's what it was. It was uh, 37%. And for 2023, November, it moved up to 41%. And is that the total, 37% of the total? On our program. On WIC? On WIC, yes, ma'am. Okay. Commissioner Powell, let me just explain one thing to you. WIC is one of those programs that we unfortunately are limited in terms of what we're able to abstract in terms of data from the program. We use a system that is... Um, it's a, it's a state administered system and we have very limited capacity to do analyses with the data that are we put into the system we can't actually get very much of it out and so we are only able to disaggregate race by race and ethnicity separate but not together and so this is a bit misleading because it says here that most of our we have about a half and half white and black participant but in fact the majority of the white participants are hispanic um and so the this the difference you see here is is looking completely separately at race and ethnicity as two different descriptors. Uh, and so when you say 41% Hispanic is a mix of people who identify as white Hispanic, black Hispanic, or other Hispanic. Uh, but so these two are, are um, these two graphs show the same population of people. It's odd. Uh, it is. It's just, if we could narrow down the Hispanic and disaggregate the white Hispanic from the non-white Hispanic and non and black Hispanic from the non-black Hispanic. We would do that, but we cannot with the system, so. Uh, and I understand. Thank you for the explanation. Um, so on that, are you seeing, because you said the Hispanic population matched the, the same ballpark as years ago. Are you seeing a change in percentage in other populations? Because the numbers go up, like a little bit in the Asian population, those numbers creeped up a little bit over the years, but not not much. So even though we have increased, you know, it's going up on the number of participants, the partic the percentage remains similar, yes, except for Asian. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And on the other slide, for twenty million dollars worth of expenses, what is included in those expenses? Is that just you know, foods, or does that include salaries? No, ma'am, that's just foods that um, our participants go and purchase at the vendors. Okay, and then for Commissioner Meyer, I don't know if this is related, but you guys can tell us. Uh, I was behind someone in Food Lion, and there was all kinds of drama about the WIC because they didn't have an ID that matched the card. And I don't know if that's why Walmart's the only place that takes it. You... No, typically they, they don't need to provide an, an ID to use their debit card. They just go through the line or where they run their, their food items, of course, through, and then they just pay for it with their debit card, just like you and I would pay for it with our debit card. Um, they don't need a an ID to identify themselves unless something came up on the computer and I think the person had been in with multiple cards that day and okay. that's what caused it. But uh, I don't know. I just wondered when she, when you asked that question, what it was related to. It's good to know. Um, thank you. Uh, my welcome. best friend was a Mecklenburg County uh, WIC nutritionist for all through the nineties. So here in Mecklenburg. Yeah. Who was that? I'm not going to say on okay. <laughs> television, <laughs> but thank you for your work. All right, well, I, I, Bernard didn't say this, but I will note that WIC is one of the few programs where we are able to almost immediately issue benefits to people. So they are able to print their debit cards in office, which is unlike most of our other programs. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Rodriguez, McDowell. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First of all, I want to say thank you for your presentation, and I love the pace of it because I could absorb as you were speaking, and and I love that. Um, so thank you. I really mean that. Um, I also wanted to say that um, there's nothing that makes you feel more powerless than the idea of them cutting this program to that degree. Um, I actually did sign the petition that came through our, our NACO committee. Uh, through, you know, No Kid Hungry was organizing that, and I did sign that, but, you know, you kind of feel like, you know, that so powerless. Um, but I just wanted to confirm uh, one of the things that you said uh, on page four. Um, I just wanted to check uh, all three of those criteria you have to meet 
Um, so you live in North Carolina, the, the, the income guideline, and then the last one, be at nutritional risk as determined. So do, like, do you have to have a doctor's note or something? Um, no, you just no, have to say. No, ma'am, we take your word for it. If okay. you tell us you have um, high blood pressure or diabetes, we take your word for it. Okay. So even if you're not a breastfeeding, a, a, you know, even if you don't fit the other criteria of like in the name, right? So again, you say, so if you are, if you're, if you have a uh, nutritional risk and you live in North Carolina and you have that family income, you don't necessarily have to have a child, but you're, you know, you're, I'm trying to figure out, is it just women Dad. And children die. Could you be a man? No, no. You can. You have to be a woman. No, ma'am. You you can't be a man and be on the WIC program. You can't. Have to be a woman. Okay, yes, so that's yeah. another criteria you need to put on there for <laughs> for who's eligible. Because <laughs> you know, just, yeah, yeah. That seems that seems odd, but okay. So so if you're a single dad, your kid no, could get if, it, but yes, not you. It, it, right. It your child could get it if you're a single father, but but you wouldn't be eligible for the program as a man. Okay, got it. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Just a, a couple of questions. Uh, one, in terms of caseloads, you did in the macro. Is there is there an uh, individual um, nutritionist uh, having a certain caseload, like 100 or 200 or 1,000 or yeah, we use the formula one nutritionist per 1,000 participants. Wow. And so that averages to about roughly 15 to 16 right. participants that they would see daily. The other, other question, you, you said that the rise, it was lower when the economy was great in 2018, but it went up to 20, 26,000 like in 2022. And the economy is... Uh, you didn't characterize the economy for 2022. Well, you got COVID. You have a public health emergency going on. And so when things like that happen, um, our numbers go up. Okay. Uh, another thing that I've noticed is when we have um, a war going on and there's a recession, like they're projecting that will be coming up sometime in the near future with a supporting um, the Ukraine and the war that's going on with the Palestinians and, and Israel. So whenever, typically whenever there's a war shortly thereafter, there's a recession and the WIC numbers have a tendency to, to go up. Do we have any, um, are there any, oh no, you didn't say, that. are there any special, um, special categories for like veterans families that still have to fall in, in terms of being a, a woman and an infant. There's nothing in terms of federal religion war. That's what that clicked my brain. No, sir. Um, I know we do, we do consider homeless and migrant farmers a part of our priority one participants, right. but they still have to meet the criteria of being a woman, infant, or child. One last question, and, and that is, uh, you said L.O.P. Scarborough, had 50% of your caseload, or did I hear that wrong? That's correct, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So yeah. geography-wise, is that like Northeast Mecklenburg County, or? Well, it was Charlotte East. Um, we moved from Charlotte East off of Albemarle Road into the uh, the current CRC, which right. is, I believe, Northeast Charlotte. And so we're still... Okay able to cater to our heavy caseload in the, the eastern part of Mecklenburg County. Well, thank you. I mean, I appreciate the, the presentation. And one of the questions, yes, farmer's market, I jot it down. Yes, Can sir. they use their card at a farmer's market? No, sir. That's one of the battles I've been fighting since 2007 when I came on board as the WIC director. We had the privilege of uh, Dr. Beth Racine from UNC Charlotte do a presentation. She was doing a study based on uh, WIC participants being able to use the farmer's market. And we've been advocating for our participants to be able to use their debit card at the farmer's market. And we keep running into wall after wall after wall. Um, they keep saying it's a, it's a budget thing. But as of last year, um, I was still advocating and they told us that we are on the list 
to be able to use our debit card at the farmer's market. Um, I've, I've been banging my head on this for the longest of time because all of the surrounding counties are able to use their debit cards at the farmer's market, whether it's Iredale County, Gaston County, Union County, all of them are able to use their debit card at the farmer's market. But every time I bring it up to the state office, Dr. Washington, they tell me it's a budget uh, thing. Trotman, is oh. that a, a, a legislative thing that our delegation can engage on this back at Raleigh or what? Nope, it's just a, WIC, a state WIC policy decision. It's not really, there's no legislative aspects to it. It's just a matter of them prior, similar with like the self-checkouts at Harris Teeters and Food Lines. It's a matter of them prioritizing who they onboard to the technology needed to be able to have their interface. Um, and so it is certainly something that we need to continue to push to our colleagues in Raleigh in the WIC office, but it's not really a legislative thing. I think it's a matter of how they are prioritizing their decision making. And so uh, it's something that we can continue to, to sort of or to elevate further. Yeah, we need to keep that on the front burner because that, you know, farmers markets are starting to increase. We're providing funds for different uh, different uh, providers in terms of fresh produce and stuff like that. That was Here we are. I think one of the things, and I, this is a lot of this is speculation. I'm not sure, but I will ask. We have a lot of farmers markets in Mecklenburg County, and so it's a different, and they're not all owned by the same institution. Versus some of our surrounding counties have fewer. Um, organizations that they have to do this business with to, to make it possible. So, and there might be some kind of bridge that we can offer with the work that we already do with farmers markets. And so it's something I could put back on our list of things to prioritize in a conversation with them. All right. I'll ask my colleagues any last urgent questions for Mr. Weeks before we go to, yes, Commissioner Powell. So as a senior citizen, it's on my mind now. Um, you know, what, do you know the, the number of people that aren't on WIC that do you have a study to compare the number of breastfeeding um, participants versus the, you know, the typical population? No, ma'am, I do not. Because I always wonder, you know, do, do people bail on breastfeeding in WIC because of the easy access to the formula? And there are so many benefits. And as you know, when young people are coming through in WIC, they're not thinking about, you know, like what breast health when you're a senior. And so the long-term breast health impacts are so helpful for young people, but they're not thinking of that. And I don't know if, if that really, what I'm asking is that part of your lactation um, program, like education long-term? Yeah, absolutely. It's a requirement that we, talk about breastfeeding to our pregnant women. Um, so it's mandatory. And we offer uh, classes, uh, in-person classes, as well as live virtual classes. Those are offered every week in English and in Spanish. Um, so it's something that's stressed to our participants all the time. It's like I say, it's a requirement and we offer classes. And during those classes, we talk to them about the benefits of breastfeeding how it can reduce your chance of getting cancer, asthma. The list just goes on the benefits of breastfeeding. Um, and so that's stressed to all of our pregnant women. And our breastfeeding peer counselors, they're required to touch base with pregnant women, um, depending on when they get on a program, whether it's the first, second, or third trimester. Um, they're required to touch base, make contact with them, and continue educating them. Um, three times while they're pregnant if they get on during the first trimester, and then they have to make a couple of contacts with them after they deliver as well. I think it's so important. Like I feel like I could do a video on it because I feel like uh, people bail so early on it. And it's such an important thing for so many reasons, even for bonding. Um, yes. And so um, thank you to all the people that do that work. Uh, we don't get to thank every individual person and that's hard for as a county commissioner, mm -hmm. but the work is so important and just thank you for your leadership in, in that area. I appreciate it. Yes, yes ma'am, absolutely. It's, it's definitely a big benefit. Um, that's one of the things I'm so proud of when my son was born, I was the first one to put him to my wife's breast. So I fed him his first meal and I'm proud to say that my wife, <laughs> All right. All right. My wife, right. breastfed <laughs> up until our son 
<laughs> turned a year old. She didn't give in to it. Um, we did have to supplement when she went back to work, um, but she hung in there and she breastfed our son up until his first birthday. And he got his first cold two weeks after she stopped breastfeeding him. So it's a gold it, star. Yeah, it, it, it definitely <laughs> builds the immune system, no doubt. All right. Uh, Thank you for your time. Meyer or Rodriguez McDowell, any last? I do have one question. What about um, loaves and fishes and organizations like that? Carolina Farm Trust, anything that like that is, is that WIC friendly? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. We make referrals to loaves and fishes. Um, soon as um, part of the questions that we have to ask if you have food, food insecurities. And so uh, typically when a participant says they do, we make referral to loaves and fishes. Okay. If it's in one of the CRCs, um, we'll go ahead and make that transfer over to the food pantry. And they will typically give them at least a two day supply of food there on the spot. And then they will make the contact with loaves and fishes so they can go get a seven day supply of food. Okay. So that's definitely one of our referrals that we do on a daily basis to loaves and fishes. All right, thank you. Nourish up, I guess, is the new. Thank you, Mr. Wicks. Thank you and your team for the service you provide to the county. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir, for allowing me to come and present. Uh, Deputy County Manager Trotman, if you'd introduce our next uh, presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Um, before I do that, I want to definitely say if you have an opportunity to go see our WIC staff at um, LB Scarborough Center, um, it's, it's definitely a lot of moms and, and strollers that go there. We moved from Clanton Road. He talked about that. We had mice and rats and it was raining in there. In Charlotte East, it was bad. And so we're really excited about our CRC. So thank you, commissioners, for your support. Um, our next presenter <laughs> is uh, Scott Fritz. Um, we're excited to have him because we like to showcase all of our staff and not just the directors. And he's one of our uh, stellar managers in the TANF program. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Griffin, um, Health and Human Services Committee members, Board of County Commissioners, colleagues. Um, and people of the public. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. And I am excited to present to you um, a little more information about one of our economic services programs, Work First Family Assistance. Prior to today, my understanding is you've heard about food and nutrition services and, and family and children's Medicaid, adult Medicaid. So I'm excited to give you a little more information on the area that I get to work in. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity for that. So what I'm going to be going over today is the a little bit of background. I heard um, Chair Griffin talking a little bit about the name changes that um, TANF has gone through over the years. So we're going to touch on that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about the program benefits um, for cash assistance and staffing and workload. And then if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to address those. So Work First Family Assistance, also known as Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, that's the federal name at the federal level, they call it TANF. So um, every state in the United States is familiar with TANF. And then in North Carolina, our North Carolina calls their version of TANF Work First Family Assistance. And this is a program that's based on the premise that parents have the responsibility to support themselves and their children. And this program offers short-term assistance um, in pursuit of self-sufficiency. And you'll learn a little bit more about what we do within the Work First program to help them obtain self-sufficiency. Um, uh, just a little bit of background. Prior to uh, Work First Family Assistance, in 1996, there was the Welfare Reform Act. And before that, it was known as Aid to um, Families with Dependent Children. And what the Reform Act did was instituted time limits for the Work First Program, Cash Assistance Program, um, strengthened the employee employment requirements for cash recipients. It provided additional funding for child care, and it improved, um, strengthened the child support requirement for Work First Family Assistance.
Now, TANF, the federal level, requires state governments to collect demographic evidence on all of our applicants. And that's what you're seeing here. So we are required to report out, report out monthly um, race, um, ethnicity, gender, and um, number of children in the household. So there's a plethora of um, demographic evidence that we're required to report out. And in, in NCFAS, when you complete an application, you'll have to, um, it'll prompt you to go through each one of these steps before you can move to the next step. But we collect this data, um, the customer selects their race first, and then depending on whether they identify as Hispanic or non-Hispanic, that is when they identify the, their ethnicity. And this data is collected and sent to the state at the end of the month. And the intent of this data collection is to um, ensure access to the benefits, evaluate outcomes, and to monitor and uh, evaluate trends and look for discrepancies. So that's the intent of this um, data information. So within Economic Services Division, uh, we administer two cash assistance programs. One is the Work First Family Assistance Program, and that provides assistance to needy families um, so that children can be cared for within their own home. And it also assists in reducing the dependency of parents by promoting job preparation, work readiness, and any other type of um, barriers that they are experiencing to um, full-time employment. In Mecklenburg County, Work First also administers the Refugee Cash Assistance Program, and this provides transitional assistance to help refugees who come to our community um, gain self-sufficiency, and we partner with uh, two local agencies, refugee resettlement agencies, who assist us in ensuring that they acclimate to the community. Um, We'll go a little bit more into about what the child about what the refugee resettlement agencies do in just a moment. So I've mentioned a couple of times so far that part of the Work First program is participation with the employment services. And the employment services manager is here with us. So if you have any questions about that, she's be more than happy. Um, to answer those, but I'm going to go over and give you a quick overview of that program um, because her and her group do an amazing job working with these applicants, getting them job ready, overcoming barriers, and it really is a skill set that um, they practice extremely hard. Work First Employment Services assist qualified Work First recipients in becoming self-sufficient and free of long-term welfare dependence. Their goal is to provide what they consider a family wrap around approach, which means they're looking at the family as a whole and the work first employment services or programs assesses the needs of the entire family, not just the, the applicant, not just the person who's job ready. They look at um, school attendance. So they look at the whole family as a whole to make sure that they are, um, they are ready to proceed. And they have made sure that the, everyone within case management has received proper training for family-focused social work and case management training for their staff. And their intent, of course, is to move people off of the workforce program and to become self-sufficient. This is this graph that you see, or picture really, is the life of a refugee cash assistance case. So for someone who comes to the agency with, um, through the resettlement agencies, our agency is responsible for, the, for ensuring that we evaluate them for food stamps, work first, Medicaid, and then after that, we evaluate them for any eligible cash assistance programs. The resettlement agency serves kind of like our employment social work agency does, but for this population. And the reason why we do that is because they have um, a, a much wider variety of language services, location services geared towards that population. They can work with them on immigration and citizenship. So we partner with the resettlement agencies to ensure that they can fully acclimate into our community. For Work First Family Assistance, 
Some of the basic eligibility requirements is one, be a US citizen and show or show proof of immigration status. You must verify that you are a North Carolina resident and you must meet applicable income limits. To the side of the slide, you'll see the current um, income limit and the cash payment. And I wanted you to see this because the, the income limit for a household of two is $472 per month. So that is the maximum amount they can make and still be eligible for the program. Assuming they're eligible for the program, the most they can receive in cash benefit is $236 per month, household of two. Of course, it goes up incrementally depending on how many people are in the household. But the, the greatest benefit to this program for our citizens is what Jennifer and her people do, which is the employment social work side. Um, so you definitely get a lot more um, from her services versus the cash assistance piece. Um, Additional basic eligibility requirements is they have to have available resources under 3,000. They must cooperate with child support enforcement. This goes back to the um, Reform Act that I mentioned earlier. That was one of the components was to strengthen the child support piece to cash assistance. So we do check to make sure that they've met with child support enforcement and that they continue to cooperate with child support, child support enforcement. And of course, they have to be responsible for the day-to-day -day care of an eligible child. And another piece that I mentioned that came along with the uh, Reform Act in 1996 was the time limits. So an individual can only receive up to five years or 60 months on the TANF program. And in North Carolina, they've added to that, you can only receive 20 months consecutively working with an employment social worker and then you have to be disqualified for 36 months before you can um, collect the rest of your remaining months. For refugee cash assistance, um, you'll notice that the, I only have the household size on here for one and two. This is because to be eligible for refugee cash assistance, you cannot be eligible for work first. So most of these applicants are individuals who do not have children. So to be either a single person or a married person without dependent children. So that's the target for the refugee cash assistance. You must be at least 18 years old. They're only eligible to receive refugee cash assistance for up to 12 months from their date of entry. So after 12 months of their date of entry, they can evaluate them from other programs, but they would no longer be eligible for the refugee cash assistance. And they have to live in North Carolina with intent to remain. And they have the same income limit and resource limits as the Work First Family Assistance Program. Within Work First, there are three categories of programs that a participant can receive in. One is the payee only or child only case. These are typically the cases where a child may live with grandma and um, grandma has responsibility for the child. The parent is not in the home. For these cases, there is no requirement to work with an employment social worker like there are on the case head included cases, and these are the ones where you have either a single mom, single dad, or it could be um, mom and dad both in the household. And these are um, cases where they are required to work with an employment social worker. And they have um, what they call a mutual responsibility agreement that they, when they meet with the employment social worker, they go over step-by-step -step things that they need to do to participate in the program. And then they are held accountable for ensuring that they do that. A third category of pr program that falls under Work First Family Assistance is benefit diversion. This is more of a one-time lump sum payment. It is not, it's not, it's for a specific crisis, but it's not anything expected to recur. For example, the example I always give is someone is working, um, 
they've been able to go back, get back to work, you know, consistently, have, they have a steady income, however, their car broke down, right? They don't have the resources to get the car fixed. They can come in, apply for work first, we can evaluate them to see if they're eligible for benefit diversion. And maybe that household just needs that one payment to get their car fixed so they can get back to work. So that's usually the benefit for benefit diversion. Our staffing with Work First, we have a total of 27 eligibility specialists within the Work First program. Currently, 19 of them are filled. We have eight vacancies. 17 of the 19 positions are filled with what we call eligibility specialist two, eligibility specialist three. These are people who know multiple programs. For example, uh, an ES2 may know Work First Family Assistance and Medicaid. Our ES3s may know Work First Family Assistance, family, Food and Nutrition Services, and Family and Children Services. The benefit that we see with having um, staff who can process in multiple programs, as you saw with the refugee, is when they come in, they're applying for all three benefits at once. So to prevent having to pass that to off to three different workers, if we have one case manager who can process all of that together, it's a much smoother process for the applicant. In Work First, we tend to, since we do have that, that tier of going from a one to an ES1 to an ES2 to an ES3, we're lucky where we tend to have the most, um, uh, most stable staffing within the agency for Work First. Our, our staff have been here the longest, typically. Um, so we have a, a lot of compassion and commitment to the work that they do. So we, we have very few vacancies or turnover. And when we do have turnover, it's typically because they got promoted to what we call quality and training, or they got promoted to supervisor. And a lot of our staff develop a passion for social work. Um, within the last three months, one of ours transitioned over to eligibility, I mean, to the employment social work. Uh, so most of our vacancies occur from promotion or getting into social work. So that's been a great benefit for us. All right. This slide goes over our workload and our timeliness. On the screen, you will see, for example, July, we received 688 applications uh, for that month, and we received 44 refugee applications for cash assistance, 57 reviews for work first, and about 441 changes. You'll notice that we receive a lot more applications each month than we are doing re reviews. And the reason why that happens is when EPASS uh, became functioned in both um, NCFAST and Work First became an option to apply for Work First through EPASS, we got a lot of applications that were, you know, do you want to apply for cash assistance? People would click yes, right? Who would not would. Um, so we get a lot of applications for, for people who are not eligible. So that's why that number is a little higher than traditionally it has been prior to December of 2022. With EPASS, our applications that we receive monthly went up about 300%. Of those additional ones, about 90% are ineligible. They either don't have a child in the home, they're over the income limit, or any number of other um, factors. But for the most part, the ones that we receive through EPASS are, are not eligible. Throughout the life of the case, um, working with the employment social worker, um, gaining employment, um, not cooperating with some of the eligibility requirements, that's where these changes come in. So when we say change, we're reacting to um, maybe someone gained employment and they are no longer eligible for the program. And I say this to say that's why you see we we certify or review so few cases compared to the amount of applications that are coming in. Because I know that looks like a big difference having that many applications coming in each month, but you're only doing recertifications for X number of cases.
With the Work First program, as with food, food nutrition services and Medicaid, you can apply in person at any of the locations, Coralt, VCW, um, Ella B. Scarborough uh, Community Resource Center. You can apply over the phone for Work First. You can apply online through ePass or MECNC.gov. I will note on here that you cannot apply for refugee assistance um, over the phone or online. <laughs> Thank you. I know that was a lot of information, but if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you very much for your for your presentation. Of course, I'll I'll yield to my colleagues to see if they have any uh, follow up questions for you. I'll go to my left this time. I started my right. So, uh, Commissioner Powell. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, on basic eligibility requirements, you have the, on the slide it says work first cash assistance income limit. Is that weekly, monthly? What is that? That's per month. Per month. And I will I will also note that that has been the same income limit since I've been here. I started in 2005 and that income limit has not changed. That one is not tied to a poverty income level like food and nutrition services or family and children's Medicaid may be. That's a set um, income limit that's been the same since I've been here, probably since Yolanda's been here. Yes. And Not that, that she's been here longer than I have. I, I, have, been. <laughs> I have been. And that's the monthly limit. Yes. And that limit is established by the state. Okay. I have more questions. Woo wee. So, um, like, I just think about how many expenses I had in December and just my surprise expenses. And my income, and I could barely, I couldn't have survived December without a credit card. So I think, wow, like how, how are we helping people even climb out of poverty while they're working? And then a surprise car problem. And so if you could, because it is a lot and we don't work in this area every day, if you could just talk to us about, you know, um, how we can advocate for better in in our role like especially with just talk about like some life experience and maybe somebody here where you had a person that was doing their best and how the benefit diversion program might have been helpful and why they might tell their employer well um i hear this from small businesses like they're at their max of hours that they can work and how that hurts them. You can just share some experience with that, like real life to help us understand how to advocate better. Got you. Um, Cause that's a lot um, because <laughs> if someone's working full time, they're not gonna be eligible for this program. So they would have to have lost their job due to not being able to get there, which has happened. Um, it's been a while since I have been, you know, in the lobby, but, um, and the reason I brought up the car incident is I did have um, someone who was faithfully going to and from work every day. Um, she was supporting her two small children um, due to a, a domestic violence incident where the, the father slashed all of her tires, she was no longer able to go to work. So she did lose her job and that's what had prompted her to come back into, uh, prompted her to come into the agency to apply for benefits. So her employer said, hey, if you can get this fixed, I'll hire you back. If you can get your tires fixed, I'll hire you back. I don't know if you've ever had but tires on your car, but it's not cheap. Um, one tire is about $100. So with the benefit diversion program, because she wasn't interested in ongoing payment, she wanted to go get back to work. The reason why she wasn't working was because her tires were slashed. Um, so through the benefit diversion program, we calculated a budget for her. She was eligible because she wasn't currently working. And we were able to provide her with the, the money to go out and buy her tires for her car. And then the next month she was back at work. So um, benefit, and there have been times, and Lucille may be able to speak about this, but we promote benefit diversion over work first family assistance um, during some plans, yearly, yearly plans. 
All right, you have another, you get two, three minutes. Let me get her. For, me. Forgive me. Thank you. I know you, I know how to reach you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be a second round with three minutes. All right, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. If on number um, 28 or actually 12, I'm not sure what the um, workload and timeliness. Yeah, that one. Um, can you, I'm trying to understand this. I'm not trying to understand. So say in July of 23, 668 applications. Yes. And then um, out of, is it out of that 57 were recertifications or that's plus? No, ma'am. So 57? the recertifications would actually have been um, what we recertified in July of 2023. They would have been improved, approved August 2022. So because they're certified for um, the certification period. Okay. So that would have been from the prior year. For the prior but you, year. Um, but you can see it's consistently significantly less than the number of applications that are coming in. Right. And so, okay. And then, so 668 applications for assistance. And then how, does that mean they're all approved? No, so those, these are just the total applications that came in, whether it's e-pass, walk-in, mail-in, or over the phone, was 668. Of those 668, um, only about 200 were potential, were eligible for Workforce Family Assistance. Okay, um, and what is changes? And changes are when we work closely with the employment social workers, so when um, they are not in compliance with, let's say they had to complete 10 job searches for the month in order to, to maintain eligibility. If we get a note from the employment social worker that they didn't complete what they were required to do, then we go in and, change, and close their case or terminate their case or sanction their case. That's a change. Mm -hmm. Or if a customer calls and says, hey, I'm now working full time for Walmart making X numbers of dollars. Uh, we enter that income and that's a change. Okay. Someone moves to another state, you know, that's a change. So um, in in each of these months that you're showing, July to November, well over 650 at each month, new applications. I mean, they, they have some kind of need, even though they may not be eligible. There's that there's still a need. They they have a need. Yes. Um, what they, we've they noticed is a lot of people are on the e pass to apply for food and nutrition services or family and children. So there is a need there. Um, when you apply, it does gives you the option. Do you want to apply for all three programs? Most people click yes. Um, then after talking with them, usually the intent was just to apply for new, food and nutrition services. But hey, it gave me the option, so I tried it out. Okay. A lot of that those um, don't have eligible children. They're single households, homeless, um, which is why they're not eligible for the Work First program. Okay, that makes sense. Then, thank you. I'm glad I clarified. That's it. Right. Let me thank go you. to Commissioner Rodriguez yeah. and Rudal, get her in to two, what, 219? Yeah. Um, oh, we're running out of time, are we? Okay. Um, I, I'll just uh, I'll just pass then. Well, we thank you. Time. We're coming in until 230. Okay. 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 Well, uh, this might be a dumb question, but no, 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 there are no dumb questions, and it's at my meeting. You haven't heard it yet, so. <laughs> uh, and you haven't heard my answer. So <laughs> we could be working together. Five, <laughs> uh, on page five, it, it talks about program benefits, and um, so on the WFFA it says provides assistance to needy families so that children can be cared for in their own homes. So I was just wondering when it says cared for, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean children are at risk of being removed from their home? You know, like, can you, can you Probably, kind of color uh, that in? Yes. So one of the programs I mentioned was the pay only or the child only cases. So in your own home with a relative, with someone you're familiar with. So grandma may take custody of the child or the aunt may take custody of the child. So the intent is keeping them with the family. And if we can do that and provide them some additional resources to assist them in caring for the child, that will help them stay within the home. Also, um, you know, job ready activities and helping their parent with 
you know, some, some additional barriers that they have would be beneficial to the child and preventing that next step of going into alternate care. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Good. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. All right. One, one last question. Alibi for anyone. Uh, Powell, Meyer, Susan, anyone? Y'all good? good? Yeah, I, I want to certainly uh, thank you, um, Scott, for your presentation and your team's work. Um, what I get from this is that we have to do a, our community, which has included everyone in the community, not just Mecklenburg County, <clears throat> some folks, uh, not just Mecklenburg County, but everyone have to provide opportunities for folk in terms of upward mobility, to provide the training and the support uh, to help people because um, as you see the income limits sort of forces you to, 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 to go back and forth into the system. And we can do a much better for a great number of our residents uh, by just bearing down and providing the continuity to support in terms of education, uh, the wraparound services, the nonprofits. Um, we, we have a lot of work to do, but uh, it is it is no fun uh, necessarily being on one of these programs if you have to be on one of these programs. Uh, so, but anyway, with that said, there's one other piece uh, that we didn't talk about that's in our packet. Uh, will somebody kind of speak to that before we close out? application the mutual responsibility agreement plan of action oh yes yeah. so um let me put that up. so so the, um the mutual responsibility agreement so when they get assigned an employment social worker they are required to sit down, go through um, what their expectations are in order to be on the program. And what you'll see in the uh, mutual responsibility agreement is just, um, there's just the information that they'll have to go through. For example, they have to uh, commit to co consistently contacting their so, um, social worker and case manager, stay in contact so they always are, have access to you. Um, you have to commit to accepting any reasonable job offer. Um, you submit verification of your activities. This is, I mentioned previously about doing job searches. So when you meet with your employment social worker, they'll, they'll give you a, a job search sheet and you're required to complete X number of job searches per month. And then you'll meet back with your employment social worker. And this also feeds into the changes. If any one of these things are not completed timely, that gets put in as a change, which causes your case to be terminated, which is an, another reason for the low number of recertifications each month. I, I do have the dumb question, Susan, not you. <laughs> um, we're closing out on income maintenance, and each one of the presentations have left us with a packet, an application packet, a Medicaid application packet, a food stamp application packet, et cetera. So there's no such thing as a unified application team. Correct. Wow. Uh, well, colleagues, you've all <laughs> copies of the various forms you have to fill out to get to get help. Uh, Mr. Trotman, uh, your team uh, has done a great job from my perspective in terms of income maintenance. And that's what I really wanted us to do as a because we do serve as a board of social services, a consolidated human service and board. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm real happy at this point. You'd say, I don't really say that, but um, I'm, I'm yeah, happy. Yeah, I, do. <laughs> I do say that. <laughs> no, no, but I, I, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative uh, to have gone through all of income maintenance and uh, it really uh, is enlightening to see exactly what, what happens. And what you guys have to do in, toward, in terms of, of delivering the services, but more particularly, uh, one of the specialists that's a multitasker that knows all of the, the programs, uh, those folks need to be, I don't know what you call them, uh, 
level five, level 10. Level <laughs> three. <laughs> level three, okay. Uh, but just to rate to, the, to that group of employees who are able to, to go from this program to that program and provide quality services to folk who often may find themselves in a crisis situation. Commissioner Rodriguez, we're down. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess one thing that I'm, I, 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 a question that I have is that I'm struck by the low numbers um, for the TANF families for the workforce. So 60 months, like there's got to be, and, and forgive me for not putting all the pieces together. Um, but if, if these folks are that income level, the shocking income level or limit, if, Okay, so the folks that are right above that to the next program, like what? what's the next one up from that? <laughs> well, one of the things, um, each state has can adopt its own rules. They can make the rules more restrictive and not less restrictive. The TANF program is actually a 60 month program. But our state has adopted some extremely restrictive rules with very low um, uh, benefits, um, and which really, you know, limits our ability to, to support folks. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you all have done, um, I think we have probably the most robust um, uh, work first team in the country where we employ social workers to actually work with these families, not just the adults, but also the children in the household and develop a family plan for them. We work with Crisis Assistance Ministry and all the other different organizations to get them employed if um, they're eligible, or we help them apply for social security disability benefits if they're eligible for that too. So we have SOAR workers is what they're called that will help them apply for social security disability benefits. And if there are veterans, we have veterans workers that will help them do that. Um, obviously all of the other programs that we support with our crisis or other nonprofits help them financially. Um, but our state has just really not invested in this, this program. So we have to invest locally with our county funds to support them. Thank you. Yep. If you're poor in the South, you're in trouble. Yes. You need to go to California or, or New York in terms of benefit amounts, but that yes. creates a different yes. issue in terms of cost of living mm -hmm. in those places. Uh, I am I am really pleased in terms of income maintenance presentations and look forward to some of the follow-ups in the, the services area. So with that said, uh, is there a motion that we adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. Opposed, same <laughs> sign. Thank you so much. I really appreciate oh, it. Thank you for your attention. One other thing I do want to point out, um, we were lucky enough to um, um, testify in front of Congress um, for this program several months ago. And the employee, the supervisor came to a board meeting. So this was the program that our staff testified for. Yeah, I remember uh, seeing her on TV. Yep. Yeah, she did a fabulous job representing Mecklenburg County and the program and staff. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks for your hard work, Thank everyone. You. Gosh, I can't imagine. That's why upward mobility is but working in this space all the time and just how discouraged you would be. It's like banging your head up against the wall. Okay. But hopefully after six months, yeah. it's like you got all, you know, you got some intervention. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you do, but if you don't, yeah. if you don't you're, you're just you're just out there. Oh, you are walking Medicaid yeah. and food stamps. Totally. Definitely try to grab it while they're young. Thank you. Thank you.